We are living in the golden age of protests. Everywhere you turn, uh, there is, seem like, someone uh, protesting. And uh, case in point, between uh, January of 2017 to March of 2018, there was some 10 to 15 million protesters. Also, around that time, uh, there were protesters in all 50 states, even places where normally they don't protest, they were protesting. And uh, we think about some of the recent ones, uh, the ones that are close to home. Uh, I know that we had, uh, even in Kentucky, uh, Louisville and Lexington especially, uh, have had some problems. Uh, thankfully, we haven't had any here in our area. Um, but in, the, in Louisville, I know that they had some issues over the Breonna Taylor thing. And, and here's the thing, you know, uh, what happens sometimes, I think that people are quick to, uh, to get excited before they know the facts. And, and sometimes it takes a while to even find all that out. And, uh, and so uh, I think the media has a way of, of distorting things. So we have to be careful that we're not following along with, with a narrative that may not be 100%. Um, and you know, when it comes to our, uh, our police officers and stuff, I think we have a right a privilege and a right to support our officers and to pray for them. And I don't know about other places. I, I'm not, I can't speak to the, you know, maybe there needs to be changes in some other places, but I can speak for those that I am know and the people that in this community and they put their lives on the line every day, every time they put their uniforms on and the people that I know are here to serve and protect. And, uh, and I think they deserve our respect. So I don't see that our, air, our immediate area is, is a problem. I don't know about other places. I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm not uh, privy to that. But I do know this. Um, not everybody who uh, is protesting is wanting to cause trouble. I was uh, talking to a chaplain the other day who is chaplain in Louisville for the special operations unit. And they got all this going on that's been going on for a while with the Breonna Taylor and all that. And more is going to come out of that. And the jury's still out. And by the way, uh, when, when the grand jury decides what they're going to do, there'll probably be more riots, uh, whatever happens, as we understand. But this particular chaplain was sitting on a bench in the park that has now been ded dedicated to uh, Breonna Taylor. And he, as he's sitting there one day, the family shows up for Breonna Taylor, her family. And they come up and speak to him. And he says, I'm very sorry. I, uh, I don't want to take your spot and, and you know all that. And she says, oh, no, it's fine. You, you should take as long as you want. And, uh, and she said, you know, she said something like this. She said, we're all going to have to live together when this is all over with. And it lets you know that, that not everybody is uh, wanting to have uh, riots and those things, but we want peace and we want those things. So when we think about all of these things, what do these protests really do? Do they have an impact? Well, time will tell. What we do know is that a number of protest movements uh, have actually changed history. Think about Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. When, he, when Martin Luther put his 95 Thesis on the Wittenberg Chapel, that was a protest, which started the protest or the Protestant Reformation. The protest against the Stamp Act of 1765 led to the United States of America being formed. Think about Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of a segregated bus in 1965, Alabama, which ignited the Civil Rights Movement. And even the Beatles had a social impact on our world because they refused to play to a segregated audience. John Lennon said, we've never have and we never will. And they refused and they allowed everyone, no matter what color, to come to their concerts. 
And the song, one of my favorite songs, Blackbird, is even a song that is about racial inequality. So marches and rallies and all these have their place, and they certainly can have an impact and change the world if they're done in the right way. But I want to say to talk today about a, a protest that has changed the world profoundly and is continuing to change the world. That is God's protest movement. You see, the cross is a protest against wisdom and against signs and wonders and all that. It's a protest against those things. Uh, because Paul said there are those who demand signs and wisdom before they will accept God or believe in God. But he says in verse 18 that the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But unto us are being saved. It's the power of God. You see, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul says that the cross is really a protest against all of the, the world's philosophies and the world's understanding and all the signs and wonders. And Paul believed that we should live what, what we can call today as a cross-shaped life. So Paul is uh, contending some of these signs and, and wisdom and all this. And why is he so upset about all of this? Why even bring it up? Why protest against signs and wisdom? Well, Paul discovered, uh, as he said in verse 21, that the world did not know God through wisdom. That it wasn't through wisdom that the world came to know God. They didn't come to know God through wisdom. Signs and wisdom are not enough. You can have all the wisdom and you would think that that would be it. That if you could just uh, sit down and convince someone and use philosophy or use uh, even the ontological arguments or uh, the theological arguments. And all these arguments are great, but they and in of themselves are not enough to convince someone about God and about their need for Christ, really. Uh, someone said, said it like this, if, if you believe, you don't need an explanation. And if you don't believe, no explanations are enough. There's nothing can be said to convince you. So Paul realizes that something more than signs and wonders are needed to change the world. And he realized that very thing is the cross. So simple, isn't it? You see, the surprising and shameful death of Jesus on the cross is what the world needs. Because it is the cross that speaks about love and forgiveness more than anything else. And you won't find that in most of your books other than the Bible. That's kind of a shock in a way. You know, Paul is hitting the streets and he's proclaiming Christ crucified, as verse 23 says, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And some people even today say that's foolishness to talk about Jesus dying on the cross. And in the world today, many of them don't want to hear about anything about uh, a martyr or about anything about the blood of Jesus or the cross of Jesus but the cross is God's protest movement, really, and it changes the world forever. It really does. And I think we need to be a part of this movement today. And because many of us still demand a sign, people are still looking for signs. People are still wanting to find God through wisdom. Apostle Paul says, not many of you, as you look around among you, not many of you wise and noble not many of you rich and powerful, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. <clears throat> you see, you can not say that God chose me because I'm wise, because you can look and see a whole bunch of people that are not wise that God chose. And you can't say God chose me because I'm rich, because you can see a whole lot of people that are not rich that are saved. And you can't say God chose me because I'm influential because you can see a lot of people who have no nobility, but yet they're saved. And he says in verse 18, 
those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, there's a couple things this morning about the cross-shaped life. Number one is that a cross-shaped life reaches out to others. It's not about me. It's not about getting what I want. It's about reaching out to others. It's about seeing the needs of those around us and seeing the problems and being able to try to do something about it. Number two, a cross-shaped life is foolishness to the world, but it has the power to change hearts. It is the cross. It is the message. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, all, I will draw all unto me. It is the cross that brings people to God. It is not our intellectual uh, capacities. And, and, you know, I could stand up here today and, and try to remember some of my Greek and Hebrew and try to impress you with all these uh, big words and all that. But it's not going to change your heart. It is the cross of Jesus that changes hearts today. You know, the Apostle Paul knew that the people that he was talking to there in Corinth and the people in Greece were people who were great philosophers. They studied philosophy and they studied all these great thinkers and they valued philosophy and they valued all these things. And for them, it was, it was hard for them to accept that something so simple as the message of a man on the cross could be what they had to accept. And for the Jews, it was a stumbling block because that was not at all what they expected. So he says, we proclaim Christ crucified. That through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who would believe. And I really believe that the only thing that's going to change the world today is that we get back to the message of the cross. See, I don't know a whole lot about politics. I don't know a whole lot about economics. I don't know a whole lot about all those things that they're arguing about today. And you can figure that out when you go to the voting place. But I do know about this. I do know there was a man called Jesus who died on an old rugged cross for you and for me. He stretched between the heavens and the earth and he gave his life that we might have a way to eternal life. And I can tell you that for a fact that Jesus wants to come into your life and have a relationship with you. And that, my friend, will change the world if we get a hold of that. That's why he said that God has chosen uh, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He said so that no one can boast in the presence of of God, which means when I stand in the presence of God, I will not be able to say, I'm here because of my wisdom, or I'm here because of my greatness, greatness, or I'm here because of my good works. I will have to fall on his feet and say, I'm here only by the grace of God. You may be one of those who feel like you can get to heaven because you're good, or you may be just the opposite. You may be one of those who feel like I can't make it to heaven because I'm not good enough. Well, I've got news for both of you. The only way you're going to get to heaven is by the grace of God and through the cross of Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way. I was called to the hospital one night after hours to visit someone. And I went in the room and uh, this, this person, when I went in, it was obvious that it lived a rough life. And I said, what can I do for you? And they began to tell me a little bit about their story. And I found out that, you know, drugs and alcohol and these things had taken a toll on their life. And now they were dying with cancer. And this person was having a really hard time. And, you know, from what I found out, the, uh, all the nurses and, and everybody were, were just about done. This person had been very, very hard to deal with. Very rude. And, you know, I imagine if, if I was in that much pain and stage four cancer, I'd probably be a little uh, hard to deal with, too. But he began to cry as I stood, sat there in that room. And he said, I've, I've lived a bad life. I've done some bad things. And I don't know if God will even forgive someone like me. And I said, I want you to know 
that it's somebody like you that why Jesus went to the cross and somebody like me. That it's by the grace of God that we're here and God does want to save you if you want Him. And He said, I do. And I had the privilege of baptizing Him right there in that room. He went home and a few days later he come back and he's in even worse shape than he was physically. But when I talked to some of the staff, they said, what happened to this man? They said, he is a different person. He was so rude and so mean and so hard to deal with. And now he's so different. He's friendly and, and he's sharing his story and, and being kind to everyone. And they couldn't understand the difference, but I can. I can understand the difference because I know he came in contact. He met a man named Jesus. He went to the cross. And on that cross he found the Savior of the world. I'm saying today that the cross of Jesus is the only thing that's going to change the world. I don't know about all the other stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe some things need to change in our policies and all that. But I don't know about that. I just know this. That I was a man that was on my way to a devil's hell and I was, I was torn all to pieces. I was living a life and I wasn't happy. And if I hadn't have found Jesus, I would have ended up uh, in jail or dead one. And Jesus got a hold of me and he changed my life and he turned my life around. And he can do the same for you. Sometimes we get away from the cross, don't we? Sometimes we, we, we get away and we, we realize that we need to come back to that place. We need to come back to the place where we see Jesus. You know, yeah, we live in the golden age of protest, but no modern rally, no protest can ever achieve what God accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ. I think of that song when the writer penned those words, Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. And I hope today that we can share that to the world. And I hope I can share that with you. That you've been to Calvary. If you haven't ex been there. If you haven't met a man named Jesus. If you haven't accepted him into your heart and life. He's waiting on you. I, I, I know some of the people I, I used to know, some of the old Baptist people, they made getting saved so hard. Like you've got to clean your life up, or, or you've got to beg God, or you've got to, the old preacher used to say uh, they were traveling. Actually, uh, for, come from the word travailing. And I grew up, and some of my old kin folks, uh, they would travel for years before they get saved. And they'd go to the altar and they would mourn and cry for God to save them. And then they'd go out the door thinking they weren't saved. They'd come back the next Sunday and do the same thing or the next month whenever they had church. And I guess they think God is up there just wringing His hands thinking, you know, you're going to have to beg a little harder before I'm going to save you. But I want to tell you that's not the way God is. I don't care what you've done or where you've been or who you are or what color you are. The Lord Jesus is waiting for you. He's waiting. His arms are always ready. And the moment that you take that first step, He's going to meet you before you even get to the front. The night I gave my life to the Lord, little country church they were singing nothing but the blood of Jesus what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and I kept waiting for something to happen some kind of feeling or, or some kind of thunderbolt or something and none of that ever happened so I just stood up and I started to the front of the church one night in a little revival. And I came to a new altar. And I said, Lord, if you'll have me, I want to serve you. And I found out that night that his grace is sufficient. 
And I met a man named Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And I want to invite you today to come to know that same person. As the musicians come, we get ready for a song today. I want to tell you that today that the only thing that's going to make a difference in your heart to make you prepared for heaven is the cross. It's that you come to Jesus and allow Him to change your heart and to change your life. And everything else will fall into place. As we sing, I want to invite you to come and to pray today. Just before we sing that last stanza, I want to ask you to bow your head just for a moment. I want to tell you today that God doesn't want anybody, He doesn't want to lose anybody. It's not His will that any would perish. God doesn't want to lose one person. But He's not going to force anybody. And if you don't go to heaven, it's not because God didn't allow you to. It's because you made a choice. And you basically walked away from God and said, and you walked around the cross. And you said, I, I, I don't want that. But today you don't have to do that. You can come to the cross. And it's just as easy as it's saying yes to Jesus. And so as we sing this last verse, if God is speaking to your heart today, I would invite you to come down this to the front here, and I'd be glad to talk with you and spend some time with you after church. You may say, well, that's embarrassing. I don't want to go down in front of everybody, but let me tell you something. What's, what's worse than that is that you don't come down here and you leave today lost. And we don't have a promise of tomorrow. None of us do. I want to invite you to do that. Be, be a man or a woman and walk down the aisle Jesus is calling you publicly today. And I'll be glad to show you and tell you how you can know Christ today. As we sing one more verse, please come.